with the possible exception of Trump voters, no group of people in this country are subject to as steady a stream of bullshit as parents. Will too much screen time scar your child for life? Can this super fruit boost their IQ? Will your failure to potty train on the correct schedule turn them into a serial killer? Well, those are just a few of the fears that corporate greed foists upon new parents. So how do you navigate this minefield? Well, my guest tonight will be happy to help. Coven Sinopathy's new book, The Progressive Parent, Harnessing the Power of Science and Social Justice to Raise Awesome Kids, attempts to guide parents through exactly these types of questions. So first of all, Coven, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, I, I met you at Free Flow several years ago, and I've been looking forward to having you on the show ever since. Thank you for giving me that excuse. <laughs> You're welcome. So my first question to you, is: there are approximately 14 times 10 to the 23rd parenting books already on the market. Why did the world need one more? Yeah, you know, I love this question because there is so much unsolicited bad advice and unsolicited potentially reasonable advice in the world of parenthood. So the last thing I want to do is give a whole bunch of parenting advice. So I call this more of a book on scrutinizing the prevailing parenting wisdom and guidance. And at the same time, the book, I would say, is an expression of parenthood in this, in this century so far with a focus in America that, as we know, is a country that's overrun by people who claim to be pro-life, yet do everything to make life harder and more oppressive for, for parents and for children. So I would say that the book, you know, it's in the parenting section. It has some prescriptive parenting, but that only takes up a fraction of the pages. And the rest is really more about how we can position ourselves as parents and other adults in any given situation based on our varying set of values and with the resources and the information and the bandwidth at hand, given all of the available information, facts, and science where we're applicable. Okay, so it's more of a, like a meta-parenting book in that sense. Yeah, you could say that. So normally when I interview authors, I open with a question about the intended reader, but this time I, I actually want to start with the author. So for people who aren't familiar with your work, what qualifies you to write a book about parenting? Sure. I would say this question has layers because I, you know, and, and I find it really interesting because I tend to wonder what qualifies anyone to write a book about parenting, right? Whether it's a doctor or an economist or an alternative medicine proponent or a, or a psychologist. I've read my fair share of parenting books uh, over the years, and I and I talk about a couple of those books and some of, a lot of that advice in this book regarding my qualifications or or why I should be the one writing this parenting book. I'm pretty upfront in that I approach all of the issues it covers as I got to say, frankly, a mentally ill parent, and I talk about uh, my mental health issues and about mental health overall. So I'm a mentally ill parent of two kids who also happens to be a science and health writer and journalist. So that's what I, I love to do. I'm lucky enough to write about science professionally. And, and I'm also someone who cares about the truth and about science and about justice for, for humans, especially children. I also bring... My lens also includes that I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. So for all that means, I'm a, I'm a product of that era. And that also comes out in some of my work. So again, there's very little prescriptive parenting advice in the book. I mean, a lot of... I talk to friends and peers and they'll sometimes ask me for advice. And sometimes I have it because it's, it's really simple. But usually I don't have the answer. So the book... I would say does two main things. First, it walks people through how to think about and approach various parenting challenges and questions from a justice and science-centered lens. And given, you know, the reality of each person's or each parent situation. And then second, it highlights the stories and work of activists and researchers, educators and doctors and and other folks who are 
really fighting for justice for all children in their own ways. Awesome. So, okay, so let, let's take a look at the title. And I actually have two questions about the title, starting with the, the title and then one about the subtitle. So the book is called The Progressive Parent. You lead with that word progressive. What does that mean to you? And why did you choose that title? Yeah, um, I get this question from people fairly regularly because I know people have feelings about the word progressive. So fun fact for, for some folks, journalists don't usually write their own headlines. And in many cases, especially with a traditional publisher, authors don't write their own titles. So the concept for my book, I can explain, was roughly 80% sort of a big picture take on the connections between the issues I've covered in my years of work as a blogger and then a science writer and journalist, and also my experience as a parent. And then 20% of it is assignment from my, you know, assignment from my publisher to talk about a few things. And so when my editor proposed the progressive parent as a title, I had, I would say I had complicated feelings about the word progressive, but I also took the assignment as a challenge and that parents who identify with ostensibly progressive values, including science and justice, are pretty diverse and not at all a monolith. But there are a few threads that tie them together. And so that common ground is what my editor was asking me to follow. Okay. All right. So let's look at the other half then, because the subtitle is Harnessing the Power of Science and Social Justice to Raise Awesome Kids. So what makes a kid awesome? What, what is like the win condition for a parent who wants to raise awesome kids? So <laughs> I would say that the, the biggest spoiler in the book is in the dedication. I write the dedication to my own two kids and I write that they were born awesome. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And, and just a, a caveat here, like parenting can be very annoying and children can be very annoying and or boring as much as you love them. So I'm not here to say that, <laughs> that everyone's kids are awesome to be around all the time. But as biased as I am, and as much as I, you know, adore my own kids, I don't think that my children are more or less special than anyone else. So sort of do the math and you realize that the book's premise is that all children are, are born awesome and they all have this sort of brilliant prismatic universes of, of perception and experience inside each of them. And our job is largely to help them grow into their most authentic, expansive, and thriving selves. And that's a huge task. And the book does not purport to tell parents how they can achieve this. Instead, the book is questioning what parenting can really accomplish given the systems that we're all a part of. So it's saying, let's look at the situations where there's an outsized onus on individual parents to sort of take control of their kids' well-being when really good health and well-being largely depend on privilege or lack of privilege. Yeah, that's one thing that really struck me throughout the book is that unlike most of the stuff I've, I've read about parenting, you don't put 100% of the onus on the parent and, and, and act like they can overcome all of the systems and conditions and 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 privileges, et cetera, of the society that they're that they're raising their kid in. It also seemed to me that, like, yeah, the, the message seemed to be more that the kids are already awesome, and our our job as as parents or or as as guides to these kids is to help them recognize that awesomeness and 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 help them express it. So, uh, sort of on the same topic, when I first got a copy of your book, and you had to know I was gonna mention this. I, I posted a picture of the cover online and somebody commented about how disgusted they were that I would be promoting a book that tries to force a parent's political views onto their children. So there's a lot wrong with that, as as my uh, Facebook <laughs> friends were, were quick to point out. So I'm just going to throw that uh, to you. How would you respond to that criticism? I'm also in the in the still active on Facebook set of people. So I, I was watching that post or seeing the, some of the comments on that post, and they were 
fascinating and I appreciated that you that you post about it. And, you know, the, the cliche is to not judge a book by its cover, but it's only human, I would think, mm. that that you do you do judge a book by its cover. But on another level, that comment to me speaks to this fallacy, I think, that runs rampant in the world of organized atheism and secularism and skepticism. And that's this fallacy that science and justice have nothing to do with each other. And so to many of my fellow atheists, raising a child to value science would be would be neutral and good, whereas raising a child with social justice in mind would be you know, forcing political beliefs mm-hmm. onto a child. And so I would encourage that commenter, of course, to read the book. Yeah, I, the thing that really struck me most about it is exactly what you're saying, that of course you raise your children with your political values because your political values are your values. I, I just, I try to imagine raising a child in a value-free environment. I mean, you know, yeah. setting aside who would want to do that, but how would you do that? Right. It's like this, the idea of a frictionless plane in physics. Like, right. That's not applicable in, in the real world when we're driving on the actual road. <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so now you've already touched on this a little bit, but I really want to drill down here. Given the role that the distrust of science has played in recent public discourse, especially with regards to the pandemic, but also with stuff like climate change, gender science, the shape of the earth, et cetera, a lot of skeptics and science communicators bristle at the very thought of lay people doing their own research on scientific topics. But your book's starting point, the, the, the second chapter, is titled Healthy Scrutiny of Science and emphasizes some of the times when the consensus of science was wrong. So why start there? Yeah, as someone myself who loves science, I literally read scientific research for fun and like nerding out purposes. And I consider myself super lucky to get paid to write about science. I've learned that the concept of trust in science, again, has so many layers. So I've been, you know, at the March for Science with a megaphone. So if, as you mentioned, if trusting or believing in science means believing in certain findings, like that the earth is spherical and not flat, or that climate change is real and urgent, then, you know, I'm certain that all of my intended readers are already right there with us, right? But then as the book details, the consensus itself can get buried by ideology and opinion, especially when a specific bias is held widely among influential experts in a given field. And that happens more often than one would think. And I've I've followed that, that thread in two different areas of research in my work before. But as in scrutinizing science as parents... I would say that it's important to remember that more often than not, the consensus on issues that affect children is more nuanced than it is with the shape of our planet. So one of the examples the book delves into, um, let me give a couple of examples. Oh yeah, um, epigenetics and the microbiome is an example, um, infant feeding But then another one of the examples that the book delves into is gender and sex, and specifically the sex binary. So anti-trans or transphobic ideologues would have us believe that it's scientific to say that biological female humans all share the same traits and XX sex chromosomes. And they'll they'll say that this is science and to to oppose that is, is unscientific, but The opposite is true. So interrogating this ideology, which really affects all children, no matter their their gender, requires a scrutiny of the the relevant science and the related discourse. And so that's what the book argues and delves into. Yeah, I found your discussion, the the sort of opening discussion on breastfeeding, fascinating because it's it's very obviously trying to, you know, getting a a, a 30,000 foot view of it that the vast majority of the scientists working on this, especially early on, were men, mm-hmm. and they were bringing in these biases and these biases, uh, you know, around the, the ideal motherhood and and women's bodies being created for motherhood, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And 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 you know, of course, as you pointed out to me in a, a separate discussion we were having the other day, 
you know, everybody can say their side is the science, right? Like if, if all we're promoting is trust the science, then, well, you know, the, 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 like you said, the transphobes say that their side is the science, the, the anti-vaxxers say their side has the science. So if we can't actually scrutinize that science, if we can't determine real from fake, and we, if, if we can't determine truth from the scientific evidence, then what are we even doing here? Yeah. Yeah. So now, obviously, you know, parenting is something we've been doing for a while. Uh, it goes back as far as the species goes back, but it's also always changing and it's changing faster now than it ever has before. So, and, and again, I, I know that your book isn't as much about specific advice, but what are some of the problems that you see parents facing today that maybe their parents didn't have to worry about? That's a huge question. And I could, I could just chat with you for a while about it, but I would say that the most prominent or, or obvious problems that parents face today that previous generations of parents didn't have to worry about are, of course, social media and the internet, as well as the constant fear of gun violence in schools in America, which I can say is, is petrifying. And then a um, potentially a less obvious one is that you know, long, long ago, people had relied on their community essentially to work together to protect and keep all children safe and, and essentially to raise children. So the idea that it, that it takes a village didn't come out of thin air, like it would, it would be a village, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't, as so many people and parents don't have access to that to that support anymore. So again, um, it's <laughs> I get I I'm really good at identifying and shedding light on the problems in a way that that can be helpful or clarifying. And as for solving those problems, I can only give <laughs> a few of you know all of what I've learned by <laughs> by following the the activism and the res the research in that area. Well, right, and and of course, despite JD Vance's insistence that you can just ask Grandpa to to watch the kid, <laughs> yeah. there is no as your as your book makes clear, there is no one size fits all answer to these questions. And so, an honest discussion of the question is really the best we can we can generally hope for. I think. Right. So, and and I'm, I'm I've already kind of spoiled this in in sort of my gushing praise for the book. But is this book just for parents? I would say it's for parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, other adult family members, educators, researchers, and anyone else who cares about kids and the and the future of humanity. And I would say maybe even even doctors because it does talk about some of the problematic aspects of of healthcare, and that's to say very little. So I would. My own kid started reading it recently, so she just found it interesting. So it's it's a book that's kind of just like, it's me and my sort of neurodivergent, anxious parent brain being like, did you know about this? Mm -hmm. Did you know about that? And, and so and so people who are, are kind of nerdy and, and like to know about how science intersects with people's lives, I would say, I hope, find the book compelling. And I've I've heard that it is. So I, I hope that parents and non-parents alike are appreciating it. Well, it, it, at, at the risk of making you hear about it again, I, I, I have to say as a, as a Gen Xer, I, you know, I, as a person who was raised in the, went to school in the 80s and 90s with textbooks that still taught me about the three races of man, for fuck's sake. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, no, I found this book to be an excellent plain language primer on sort of where the science stands now vis-a-vis -vis race, gender, and a host of other topics that are relevant to social justice. So if you're like me and you just kind of want to know, all right, well, I know what I learned in biology and in high school is outdated. What does the science say now? I think this book is a really excellent place to go. And it's all written in a very accessible way. I think a lot of times discussions like that tend to get bogged down in, in technical language, scientific language. But I, I thought yours was very uh, approachable in that sense as well. All right. So I, I have one last question for you. And it's, it's complicated, of course, because you've been emphasizing that the book is not about giving specific advice so much as teaching people how to assess the advice they're being, being given. And so now I'm going to ask you to do the complete opposite here. If you could give an elevator's ride worth of advice to a new parent, 
And the advice couldn't just be pick up a copy of the progressive parent harnessing the power of science and social justice to raise awesome kids. What would you tell them? Okay. Yeah. Well, I, let me tell you, like so many times I'm asking other people, like my, my older kid recently wanted Snapchat because apparently all of the, the seventh and eighth grade friends communicate on Snapchat. And so I, I was asking my, my, the other parents like, oh, I, I hear that your kid has Snapchat. Can you tell me more about that? But if I, if I could give advice, like it's advice that like is, is pretty well backed by by science and by all the leading experts, I would say everything in parenting comes down to figuring out what you, you know, what you can and can't control and minimizing kids' exposure to known bad things. So having like I, I've spent the better part of a decade as a science writer covering children and health. And so everything we can do in parents, I've realized can be boiled down into a list, which I go over in the book. It includes getting the best prenatal care, getting the best health care uh, and mental health care for your kids, learning first aid and CPR, making sure to install and use their car seats correctly, strap furniture to the walls and, and televisions as well. Beware of batteries and small magnets, you know, feed, feed babies sufficiently and safely, cut grapes into quarters and other safety precautions around choking hazards. Make sure kids eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, which is easier said than done. <laughs> Avoid pollution. Let kids be who they are. You know, surround them with safe spaces and trees and protect them from cops and teach them well. And again, some of these are, are so much easier said than done. But that's that's it in a, in a nutshell, I would say. Yeah, I, I should say, I don't want to undersell the amount of actual practical advice there is in the book. Each chapter ends with, you know, some suggestions of very actionable things that you could do as a parent as well. All right. So once again, the book is called The Progressive Parent, Harnessing the Power of Science and Social Justice to Raise Awesome Kids. The author is Coven Synopathy, and you can find a link to buy a copy in the show notes or wherever you get your books. Coven, thank you again so much for your time and for a great read. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks.